So here's a discrete state dynamic, uh, discrete state dynamic programming. That's going to be the main topic of today. Um, but first, I'm just going to go over um, and remind you um, about dynamic programming and the key features of it. Um, and just to get you sort of in the right um, mode. Now, by the way, if I'm assuming that this is not brand new material to you. If, if all of this, if this general discussion of discrete time dynamic programming is totally new to you, then um, uh, you need to do some reading to get up to speed. Um, uh, let me think about what, um, okay. Macroeconomics are always gonna tell you to look at uh, Stokey Lucas, which is a nice book. And it does lay out the nice, it does lay out dynamic programming nicely, but don't get bogged down in the theorems and that. Just focus on the basic ideas. So in dynamic programming, what we're trying to do is solve for the optimal decision. Oh, by the way, I do have my chat thing up. Um, if you have any questions, type in on the chat and then I will um, uh, attend to that, um, uh, we'll be checking it. Um, the, as I said earlier, I'm, the, the, the hand raising part doesn't work for me, but just typing in something in chat and I'll get to you. Okay, so discrete time dynamic, dynamic programming in general is the uh, analysis of how to optimally control a system. Um, now, uh, here's some notation here. First, any dynamical system has a set of states. Now these states are things like your wealth or your education or a firm's capacity, a production capacity, number of machines they have or the number of ventilators at a hospital. Um, um, so that's your, those are your states. States are variables that uh, need time to change. That's why they're called states. Uh, in macro, they're often referred to as predetermined variables. Now then, at each point in time, um, you get to affect the dynamical system by choosing some control. And so let D represent the set of controls. Now, the payoff at time, oh, so pi of x u t, Pi of x ut um, represents is equal to the payoffs in period t if you're in state x at the beginning of period t and you apply control u during that period. Notice the timing here. Um, the way I've defined it is that x is the state at the beginning of the period. Um, and then knowing that state, you choose some control and apply at that period in that period. Now, uh, notice by the way that uh, uh, the payoff function um, is allowed to depend on time. So we're allowing to, for general dependence on time, which of course, if you think of this as being a life cycle model, um, T does um, uh, represent, um, you know, say your, your physical capacities over t life, uh, time, et cetera. So, um, and also your, your utility function over time. Um, so the payoff is gonna depend on time. Now you might say, well, where's the discounting? Where's the beta to the T power? Well, that's buried in here also, along with other time varying things. Now, what you can do, the tr what you are allowed to do at any point in time and sta space, state, depends on the state and the, and the time you're in. So if you want to spend a lot of money, you better have a high state level of assets in your state variable. Um, and those, uh, those uh, controls also, those options also do change with time, with age. Now, I'm trying to cover here with this notation, a very general setup. Notice that I haven't said if X is a continuum of states or discrete. Same thing about D. I haven't said that about, about its cardinality or structure. Um, <clears throat> so 
the key thing about um, a, a dynamical system is that you're in a state today, you apply some control today, and then the state might change. So if I start today with um, $1,000 in my uh, checking account, or no, sorry, in my bank account, I have to remember you Europeans don't know anything about checks anymore unless you go to a museum. But so you go to your bank account is a thousand dollars and you uh, spend 10 and now you're down to 990. Um, and so your state changes depending on your actions, your choices. Now, sometimes those changes will be stochastic. Um, so this is meant to, for example, represent um, you. You, you spend money, you buy some stock in some company, and then the value tomorrow is, is a random variable. So F of um, A semicolon X U T is the probability that tomorrow you're in state A, given that today is time t and you and your state is uh is is little x okay and yeah it should be a, and state x sub t so given that your no your state is x given that you're in x given that you choose you given that it's time t this is a probability that your state tomorrow will be in the set a so that covers everything you can think of it even covers um, uh, deterministic models where basically this probability is just um, uh, a, C a CDF with a, with a step function. So this is a very general notation. As we get to specific problems, I will of course uh, simplify the notation appropriately. Now, the key concept in dynamic programming is the idea of a value function. Now, a value function is the following. Um, suppose that you have some kind of decision rule U, or yeah, calligraphy U. So you have, suppose that U of X comma T is an arbitrary feedback rule that says what choice is made um, if, you're, if you're in state X at time T. So now, of course, that, that the, the state is going to move in a random fashion, depending on your controls and, and depending on random shocks. So, but for any given um, feedback rule or measure, the other phrase that's often used is it's a measurable uh, control because it relies only on information available at time t. Um, you take the supremum that you, you this, you plug it in and then you, this is your, for, for a particular control, um, it has an expectation of what the discounted or some value is from today's point of view. Now the value function is the supremum over all possible payouts. You take all possible strategies and you take, you take the supremum for sure so for any strategy you're going to have some value for this expectation. And then the value function is the supremum of all those um, outcomes. Now, why do we say supremum here and not max? It's because um, in some problems, the set of expectations here could be an open interval so that it doesn't have, so like the open interval, zero, one, um, doesn't have a max because one is not in the open interval zero one. Um, so there is no maximum element in that set, but one is the supremum of the set of numbers, open interval zero to one. Okay, so we say supremum. Therefore, existence happens. Basically, as long as you, as long as you have a, a set of, a well-defined set of points here, it has a supremum. Now, the Bellman equation is true it, uh, assertion about the value function, namely that the value, you define the value function at time. Okay, here's the definition of the value function. Okay, let's get clear. 
Here's the definition of the value function. That's the definition of the value function. Now, the Bellman equation is the key theorem regarding the value function. Basically, that the value at function at time t at state x is a supremum of this sum. Supremum over all possible choices. And you take, you take any particular feasible choice, you compute the payoff today plus the expected value tomorrow, a condition on where you are today and what choice you choose today. So this has, um, this is your Bellman equation. It basically says today's value function can be expressed in a very simple mathematical expression related to tomorrow's value function. Now, this is, there's a tremendous economy that's achieved by this. See, if you look at the definition of value function and you look at the supremum business, you would, this, this involves all possible paths. If you thought about um, the, the, um, the process, the stochastic process of the X's and the U's, uh, this, these are stoch arbitrary stochastic processes um, from time little t to time big t. So this is an enormous number of contingencies that must be um, examined. But the Bellman equation, the bank theorem is that no, if we know the value function for tomorrow, then we can know the value function for today. And uh, this gives us a way to think about and analyze um, problems that would otherwise be completely intractable. Um, so now uh, all that's needed for existence of, of, of um, for the definition of the value function and also for anything here is that uh, boundedness of pi is sufficient. Now you will see some math econ papers where they talk about uh, definition of value function and Bellman equation um, for unbounded pi. Um, I regard that's that's mathematics. Um, it, I can't imagine uh, a, a sensible case in economics where the payoff function is unbounded above. Uh, but maybe I'm just a pessimist. But so um, now that the first problems I describe here are <coughs> finite horizon problems. You have choices, t, t equals one is the initial time period, and then the final time period at which you have a choice and which you have payoffs uh, of the, from represented pi is capital T. But then now notice that uh, what you do in period capital T has some impact on what the state is um, in, at time t plus one. So for example, let's say that uh, capital T is the last period of your life and then X um, is assets. So, you know, you start your last year of life with some money, you spend some money, and then there's some money uh, left over. And that's going to be then um, your assets um, after you're gone. And then um, you're going to put some value on those uh, uh, terminal assets. And so this is called the bequest motive, for example, in a life cycle context. If, if this we're talking about a um, business investing in machinery, this would be the scrap value of the machines. Um, now, by the way, um, I'm, I'm playing around, by the way, when I, you might say, well, gee, I, aren't, how, where, aren't, aren't you put, gonna put a bound? Shouldn't I say, well, you can't have, you can't die with debt. Well, that's all buried in the W function. Basically, if, if, term, if, you're, if you die and you are in debt, then the payoff is minus infinity. So you can bury the constraints into, inside the, um, the payoff function, which is a common way in convex analysis to, to think about the, these things. Um, so, it, so this is a perfectly general problem but it has a terminal horizon. Now in macro and finance, the preference is to think about infinite horizon problems. 
Um, and so there, what, and also infinite horizon stationary problems. And by stationary, I mean that the payoff in any period is the same function of the state of the contemporaneous state and contemporaneous control. So uh, the where time enters into the picture is only in terms of this discount uh, beta t factor. So this is not only infinite horizon, but also stationary, autonomous. The calendar time does not enter into any decision. It affects your valuation of payoff flows over time, but um, other than that, there's no, um, the calendar time doesn't do anything, say, uh, affect anything. Again, we have a set of states, a set of controls. Um, given any, given any uh, set of point of state X, there's a con set of controls that are feasible. Here's a payoff function. Um, and again, we have our same transition probability. Except now what I have to do is that, by the way, by the way, I, a lot of times in economics papers, even if the problem is stationary, people love to write down X sub T, X sub T plus one, et cetera. Um, what I often like to do is get rid of that and just talk about expressions like this, that if today you're in state X and apply control U, then the next period's uh, state, which I denote as X plus, is, um, is the, denoted this way. And then, the probability that tomorrow you're in state in set A is this probability. And there again, the value function is defined as the uh, set of all fees. If, if U of X is a set of all feasible strategies, um, starting at X, then here's the value function. Uh, in front horizon problem, here's the Bellman equation, the stationary Bellman equation that you've probably seen <coughs> um, frequently. Now then, uh, now here I'm going to talk about the policy function. I haven't mentioned about much about the policy function because uh, you know you have to policy function if it exists is defined by this that uh, the policy you see uh, suppose you're at state X. And then you're going, to, you're of course going to take the supremum over all the fees we'll use to get the value. But now maybe there is a point U, a, a choice U that does actually achieve that supremum. And so then that's the, what we call the ARB max then. And so if, if the policy function exists, then it does have this expression. Now, by the way, in economics problems, you typically are going to have policy functions. Um, the supremum versus max thing disappears. Now then the standard, now the existence theorem here is a bit uh, more difficult because you have, it's an infinite horizon, um, uh, but basically this is the key theorem um, in dynamic macroeconomics that if beta is less than one, and you have this stationary time autonomous system, then, uh, and you define this mapping TV, so where you take some function V, and then for each X, you do the supremum, that then gives you a function TV. And this expression is, I should write TV of X. So, um, the map, the mapping, the function is TV, and this is an instance of, of TV at X is defined to be equal to this. And the key thing is that this map is monotone in V. By the way, let me emphasize this. It, by that, I mean that if you increase the V on the right-hand side, then the V on the left-hand side, the TV is also going to go up. And this is just because um, uh, all the items here, all these components of the value function are weighted by probabilities and probabilities are always going to be um, non-negative. Non so probabilities are different from the price of oil. Oil can have a negative price, but probabilities cannot go negative. So this is just a non-negatively weighted sum of the Vs. This is a positive number also. And so you increase the 
of part of V, and uh, then you will increase every possible summation here, and you'll increase the TV function also. <clears throat> and then because beta is less than one, then this actually is a contraction mapping and there is a unique solution. Now, economics, yeah, I think you've seen a lot of the um, uh, applications. Uh, um, dynamic programming actually comes out of operations research more generally, um, uh, but um, the methods used for solving, the problems are different in operations research, and so the, the, um, uh, the, al the algorithms are different. In operations research, a lot of the problems there have an a integer feature to it. Um, for, and by the way, if you want to see how OR people do um, dynamic programming, uh, Powell's book, Approximate Dynamic Programming, is very good. It gives you an idea of, um, of the kinds of problems they look at. Uh, like, for example, one, one example of such a problem is, uh, suppose you have a fleet of trucks, and, but then you also have uh, uh, customers who want you to pick up something from one city and take, deliver it to another. Well, that's a dynamic programming problem, but it has some, um, but it has an integer characteristic to it. it also probably has some non-convexities um, to it. Now, uh, one of his students actually did a very nice thesis on blood banks, because managing a blood bank um, <coughs> is a dynamic programming problem, because you not only do you have different types of blood, so I mean, if, if somebody needs blood, uh, no matter what blood he has, he can take a type O, he can take a type O blood. Um, uh, and then, so, yeah. But, and then there's uh, some type of blood that can take anybody, any other kind of blood. Anyway, so there's matching issues. Also, what makes blood banks difficult is that there's a um, spoilage rate. The blood can be in a blood bank for only, I think, at six weeks, and then you have to dispose of it. So you have it for each kind of blood. By kind, I mean, you know, A, B, whatever the letter system is, and then you have other factors, RH factor. Um, <clears throat> some of us, I, like I have what they call baby blood. It's missing some antibodies, and so they love giving it to babies. Um, so once you have all these uh, inventory ca characterized, you then have to manage drawing down the inventory um, so that every so the all the blood that that's there gets used before it goes stale. So it's an interesting dynamic programming problem. Um, but the the key thing is that in economics uh, we have a lot more structure mathematically, and so the kinds of methods that the OR people love to do, particularly something called a stochastic programming, are um, uh, very inefficient for economics problems. Um, okay, so let me just remind you of some problems you've probably seen. The deterministic growth model, which is uh, something you're gonna see ad nauseum um, in this course, is a simple model where you have, uh, I call this the corn economy. Um, I don't know if uh, corn is spelled with K in some language, but it's a corn economy. So you start with a certain amount of corn, K sub T at the beginning of period T, you plant it, the corn, the corn kernels of corn, and then uh, in the fall you ha have uh, this amount of corn in the field. Um, and then you have all this corn in the field, you take out, you take, you pick the corn and then you uh, take all the kernels off the corn cobs, and now you have a big mountain of kernels, now, some of those uh, kernels you'll consume. Um, but now there'll be some left over, and that gives you your seed corn for, um, to plant next spring. So this, any kind of uh, uh, vegetable or any kind of plant matter where you, you, take, you create the seeds, you, you know, the seeds come to you in the fall, you eat some and some you save for the next spring's planting. That's what this is. And 
corn comes to my mind as an example. So now <coughs> you have um, you you have utility over your consumption of the corn, um, and it's gonna it's not going to depend on calendar time, but at time zero, you're going to choose a sequence of consumptions and cattle stocks to maximize the present value of utility, but also be consistent with this constraint, that the, the seeds that you have to plant next tomorrow is equal to today's production minus today's consumption. By the way, in macro, this would also be called a, a, a model with 100% depreciation, um, because it's like all, because all of the initial capital stock disappeared. There's no, that's a hundred percent depreciation rate. That's another expression. Now, one thing we know is typically is the Euler equation comes, is true. Basically, the marginal utility of consumption today is equal to the discount factor times marginal utility of consumption tomorrow times the marginal gross product of uh, corn tomorrow. So that just says I could, if I have a unit of corn, I can either consume it or I can plant it. And then that unit of corn gives me this much extra corn tomorrow. And then I consume all that extra increasing my uh, utility um, by this amount. Now, notice in the Euler equation. Now, by the way, the people think that you know, most any economics problem can be analyzed using a simple Euler equation like this. That's not quite true. Notice that what you really, if you thought about this in terms of sequence of Ks, what's going on here is that at the margin, you increase savings by one unit today, and then tomorrow you consume all the extra production from that savings. So basically, this the, the change at the marginal change you make here will affect tomorrow's capital stock, but has no effect on any capital stock in future periods. <coughs> so that's a key feature here, which, by the way, isn't true. For example, if you have a time to build model, so um, this is a feature of this these simple models that, if you're not careful, disappears. Um, now, what's the belt? Here's the Bellman equation for this. Um, the v value function is maximum utility plus beta V of, um, of uh, tomorrow's capital stock. Now, I want to point out two kinds of uh, equations here. By the way, there are two unknowns. You don't know the consumption policy function and you don't know the value function. So uh, you have two unknowns, two unknown functions. You better have two functional equations. The first equation here is your Euler equation. And now notice that what I did is I, I wrote it so that everything's on the right-hand side. Um, maybe if I brought the, uh, one way to express it is having the V prime on the left-hand side. So V prime has to equal the marginal utility of consumption times the marginal product of corn. Okay, that basically says that the marginal value of corn today has to be the value of, if I took that extra unit of corn, and planted it and then consumed the proceeds. That's the first, that's a first order condition. Now, this is the equation involving the value function. Now, this equation has meaning by it, all by itself. This is a functional equation um, for the unknown function V. Now, if I plug in some C of K, any, some C of K function, some policy function, if I plug that in, then what I have here is an equation in terms of the unknown function V. By the way, that equation can be solved out for the unknown function V. And so sometimes it's useful to think about the value that corresponds to a specific policy. Many times in economics, people talk about dynamic programming and the, and the value function, 
and they tend to focus only on the value function related to the optimal policy. But for our purposes, it's useful often to think about, well, suppose C is uh, some policy, but an arbitrary policy. Well, what is its value? Well, its value is def de um, defined by that equation. Now, by the way, that doesn't look like a fun equation because this tells you that V of K is uh, related to V at some other value uh, in its domain. Now, this is, um, this actually, by the way, this, this is just, um, in, in, this is not a bad equation. This is, this is a linear equation uh, because everything is linear in the unknown function V, but you have to take a, a functional point of view to this. I'll talk about more about that later in some other context. But the key thing here is that any policy C, any policy has a value. And then the optimal policy is one that produces the best possible value function. Now then I'm gonna hear some other examples, stochastic growth accumulation. Uh, well, you can read through those um, uh, later. Now, today I'm gonna focus on problems that are discrete state and discrete control. Now, <clears throat> why do I do that? Well, it, it's a very special structure. Um, but the computational ideas related to solving it, um, there are multiple computational ideas, and, um, and many of them can be translated to other problems, more general problems. But first, I want you to see them in this nice, clean, simple fashion. So we have states, a discrete number of states. It could be wealth. Now, by the way, when you're looking at problems with life cycle wealth, <coughs> you, you might object to discretizing wealth, and I often do, because um, if, if, if the units of wealth, let's say the units of wealth are, uh, let's say XI represents $1,000 in wealth. Well, I suspect you would say, well, that's not a terribly useful description for, um, um, for any of your decision making, um, because that would say that you, your spending has to be in lumps of $1,000. But if XI, the state of XI was meant having I uh, Swiss francs, and that you had, let's say, uh, 20,000 states here. Um, so one state would be having one Swiss franc and then two and three. Well, now that has, um, that's a, still a discrete problem with a finite number of states, let's say 10,000. Um, but now I, you probably wouldn't, be, wouldn't object as much to um, the lumpiness in the problem. And so the um, wealth is sometimes a reasonable, uh, thing to do if you discretize it finally. Now, by the way, education is something that's naturally discrete. Um, how many years of education um, can you have? Um, and education is described um, in integer fashion, so it's a natural thing to have discrete. Also, job experience is measured in number of years on the job. So, that, but, so those are cases where discretization is fine. Now, capital, again, should be finely discretized. Now, you have controls. Now, that may be investment, or it could be if a life cycle problem is consumption, but there again, you want, yes, they can be discrete, but again, you'd like them to be um, not too lumpy in many cases. Now, here's the key feature about the process. So you have a state, X. And you make you choose some control U. Now, where are you going to be tomorrow? Well, suppose that you're in state I today, and you make a choice U, then the probability that you're going to be in state J tomorrow is equal to this Q sub IJ evaluated at U. 
by the way, U is discrete, so I could have done another subscript for that, but I, I don't, you know, I'm not going to do that. So that now, so basically what happens is that, now by the way, notice that these transition probabilities can depend on calendar time, but what happens is that for each calendar time, when you write down these probabilities and collect them in a matrix, an IJ matrix, then what happens is that this is a Markov transition matrix at T, given that you choose control U. Now, of course, you're going to be able to choose the control U, but, the, but this is just the Markov chain. Given that if you choose little u, this is the Markov chain uh, of what, what that does to every possible value of the state. Of the state. Now then, um, here's a payoff function at time t if you're in state x and control is u. <clears throat> now, for the finite horizon problem, we again have some terminal valuation. Uh, now, the value function is defined just as we defined it before. It's the supremum of whatever, but thing is, since everything here is finite, um, uh, the, there is going to be a max. Um, now, here's the um, Bellman equation. The time t value function it satisfies this Bellman equation. Now, notice that I'm calling this, th this at time t, the value function is really a vector. So the word function is maybe seems a little bit inappropriate, but it is a function mapping um, a finite set of integers into the real line. So it's a function, but then we switch to um, index notation because it's a vector. And so uh, this, <coughs> so the Bellman equation says that uh, for infinite horizon, uh, this, oh, this is for fine horizon. So the Bellman equation says that the value at time t in state i is the max of this finite set of numbers. And this is true for all, for i equals one to n. And also, this is also true for, you know, time, all time little t. Now, by the way, this is a case where this can be solved, you know, you see the max thing here is just evaluate uh, this payoff sum for all possible values of u. It's a finite set of numbers. You take the max, and that's the value. So uh, there's no copy. There's not. The, it's computationally trivial. And then what you do is you have the terminal time, and so then you just go backwards. You use a Bellman equation to give you what the value function is at capital T, capital T minus one, etc. Now, by the way, this is the only choice for <clears throat> finite horizon problems. You can't use any of the other fancy choices for infinite horizon problems because this is a time very problem. It's a non-stationary problem. Um, so now let's talk about infinite horizon problems. That's uh, a more common problem in um, many contexts in economics. So now let's look at that. Now, infinite horizon problem, the Bellman equation, does correspond um, to this set of equations. Notice that, by the way, notice that here, the equations for the time t value function, the components of the time t value function does not appear on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side here, all you see are components of the time t plus one value function. Now that's different here. You, vi is equal to the max of this sum, but now for any i, vi also is going to be part of this sum. Pro most likely we be part of this sum. So now what we have is a finite system of equations for the unknowns. There's finite one equation for each n, um, but now it's a simultaneous system of equations because each of these VIs appear on both the left and the right-hand side. So it's just a finite system of equations. Now, <clears throat> it's not a nice finite system of equations because you have the max operator here. But the key thing is it is a finite system of equations. Now, oh, okay, a little glitch here, okay. Value function iteration in this context for infinite horizon problems, we can still think about value function iteration. 
But what we do is this, we, we start with some arbitrary um, guess for the value function. And so then if we wanna, so let's say with K equals zero, um, we plug that in here and then, then V1 can be computed just by doing the max where K equals zero on this side. And then um, that's your next guess. And you just keep computing, recomputing this over and over and you'll have <coughs> a, a sequence of value functions, which will converge by contraction mapping to V star, the true solution. So value function iteration says you, you plug in some guess for the value function and you just keep hammering it over and over and over with this uh, max operator. So that's value function iteration. Convergence is kind of slow because this is only a linear uh, converging process and uh, the, you have this error bound, really similar to what we talked about earlier in the course about error bounds on uh, processes or sequences that converge uh, linearly. But um, that value function iteration is one way to go. It is, okay, and then here I just uh, write out in gory detail. Um, you start with some initial guess, and then um, suppose you have B, you, you, you have guess L, and then you compute V, of the, the L plus one guess of V at component I by doing this max, you keep going round and round and round until you, um, you've converged according to some criterion. And then, uh, then what you do is um, once you have the, the, the solution, you then compute what the policy is. And okay, you compute what, yeah, what the policy is base um, at each state, what the payoff is at each state, et cetera. <coughs> and stop, okay, so. Now, value function iteration is very slow. And we're going, we can dramatically, okay. Okay, let's, okay, okay, okay. I know so I use lower values for beta to prove convergence. Uh, um, they assume a subjective and they, however, suppose that one cannot assume a lower. Oh, okay. Yes, that's coming up. <laughs> um, yes, that can, um, yes, if beta, you see, if beta is close to one, this is gonna be very slow. And so we, um, yeah, we want to find something that um, goes faster. Now, by the way, later on in the course, you will see a presentation where uh, we solve problems. Well, I shouldn't say we. Uh, Philip and um, Gregor solve problems where beta is greater than one, and that the 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 maximum likelihood estimate of beta is greater than one. So one can do econometrics for beta less than one, equal to one, or greater than one. Um, but today I will stay with beta strictly less than one. By the way, there's a big um, OR literature on uh, beta equals one. Um, uh, but um, given that we don't know what beta is, it's, it's a kind of a degenerate case. Uh, so beta less than one, I'm gonna talk about today, beta bigger than one, that's a topic for a future lecture. Now, here's the first way to improve convergence. See, what, what happens in value, func in value function iteration is let's, let's go back to value function iteration here. <coughs> what's, what's gonna happen in practice is that you're going to be computing, you're gonna be updating this value function, but what you're gonna find is that in each iteration, 
the, the policy choice is going to be pretty much the same. The choices don't change as you iterate. It's just the value function is going to change um, at a slow rate. So, um, so policy iteration, also called Howard improvement. Now, by the way, okay, macroeconomists um, use the phrase policy iteration to refer to something other than this. Um, so uh, Howard Improvement, if somebody says Howard Improvement, that, that this is what they're talking about. Policy iteration, uh, that, you know, you have to judge from context what they're talking about. Um, and often the context won't tell you what they're talking about, so you have to guess. Um, but uh, Howard, by the way, um, not surprising, it was a professor here at uh, Stanford in the OR department. Um, and I don't know if Howard is still alive. I do know the OR department was executed several years ago. Um, but so um, here's the idea. Suppose you have a guess for the value. Now, let's suppose that you take, you do the value function iteration step, but suppose now you, you keep track of what the decision was so that UI super K plus one, that's the decision that you made at state I when you did this optimization problem. And then you don't just update the value function. What you do is you say, now, okay, now I have a policy function, U super K plus one. And now what I'm gonna do is compute the value of following that policy forever, not just for one period. You see, with value function iteration, you compute a new policy, but you use it only to update the value function one period back. No, we're gonna say, suppose that I have this new policy and I wanna know what's the value of it if I used it forever. Well, when you write that forever part down as a infinite sum, what you'll see is that the value function v super k plus one. So this now is this is now the next guess for the value function under policy iteration. The the see remember before I talked about what is the value of a particular policy. So this is now the Bellman equation for a particular policy. Um, so where you just, in the policy P component, you plug a piece, you plug in the policy, uh, the K plus one policy choice. And now you end up with a linear set of equations in the components of V super K plus one. So once you have pinned down all the little U's uh, that are in here in Bellman equation, you now have a linear equation for the components of the value function. Well, that's nice. Linear equations are trivial to solve. Yeah, well, um, okay, they may not be trivial to solve, but anyway, you've seen I've reduced it to solving a linear system of equations. And uh, by the way, what's typically gonna happen here is that this is gonna be a sparse system of equations. This may be very large, but um, it's typically gonna be sparse. And so it typically is, um, if you've got the right software and hardware, easy, easy to solve, unless you have some enormous problem. But anyway, now notice that what, what happens this in practice, this goes a lot, lot faster than um, uh, value function iteration. Now, um, and so, and, and also notice that beta, Beta can be, well, beta still needs to be less than one. And it can't be just infinitesimally less than one, um, but because then the matrix gets to be singular. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is gonna be a linear set of equations. Now you might wonder, well, what happens, what do OR people do when beta equals one? Well, they uh, do a, um, a normalization so that it works. And beta bigger than one, I'll leave that to Greg and Philip to tell you about. Um, but you, you always end up with this kind of equation. Now, 
So policy iteration is going much faster because typically what happens is you do a few iterations and then you've found the right policy, the optimal policy, and then you compute that and you say, hey, that's it, I'm done. Because you basically keep going until you, until you get the same policy twice. Um, so it's much, much, much faster. Uh, doesn't depend on beta. Beta does, it, its convergence rate does not depend on beta. Uh, and it depends only on, basically it depends only on monotonicity. Basically what happens here is that uh, you plug in something here and you get out of V. Now then you plug in, uh, you compute policies which improve this payout and, and now those policies are going to just increase these um, components and everything's just going to go up, 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 and monotonicity. Also, the other thing is that if you start with an initial guess that's above the true value function, it's just going to come down, down, down. Monotonically, if you start below, it's going to come up, 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 monotonically. All very nice. And here's the uh, formal uh, layout of it. Now, there may be some problems where the number of states is just too, too big. So then what we do is we assume that the new policy is used for K periods. Uh, too many uses of K, but so we use it for K periods. So <coughs> we, we say, okay, now today we're at this guess VL. And then now what's the value in uh, K periods before? And it boils down to being this. Now notice that this is now just uh, uh, you have this Markov transition matrix raised to some powers and uh, then add it up. So this is more, this is more direct. Also, by the way, if you have a, an enormous problem, uh, then uh, where these are enormous matrices, then you could probably can pull out some parallel algorithms for multiplying, um, for taking powers of matrices and multiplying matrices and vectors. So uh, this is, Good. Now, um, the Putterman-Shin theorem uh, gives you sort of an error bound. And basically, now, you see, if you, if you didn't have the, um, you see, this convergence rate is beta for normal for value function iteration. So basically what they say is that the, the error bound is at least as good as value function iteration, but possibly better. And because notice the key thing here is that part of the error bound is the difference between the last two, uh, um, is the difference between the, the, your last iterate on the policy iterate and the true policy function. And so that's going to, you're gonna find that that's going to, um, be pretty fast. So, um, so this is a theoretical thing because you don't know what U star is, but what's going to happen is that as you iterate, um, this is, these two things are going to get close. And once they're close, um, the convergence is going to be rapid. Now, the key thing that that you need to remember here in order to think about if you're gonna to try to do things quickly is that um, get away from this time iteration perspective. I mean, value function iteration for infinite horizon problems, people still think in terms of tomorrow versus today and then versus yesterday. Now with discrete state dynamic programming problems, the whole notion of today versus tomorrow is, is, is disappears because what you have is just a, uh, a system of equations involving all the components of the value function. <clears throat> there's nothing about tomorrow or there's no T or T plus one here. This is just a simultaneous set of equations. That's all it is. It's just a simultaneous set of equations. It may be large, by the way, it's likely gonna be sparse. Um, 
so uh but yeah so it's it's a large so when i when i talk about this being a simultaneous set of equations i'm thinking of of this max operator as being done okay and then and then the v is um shows anyway so anyway it's it's a not it's a nonlinear system of equations with unknown v it's also got unknown u's but that disappears because of the max operator so it's an unknown system uh, a big system of equations and unknown v's now <clears throat> so what we can do is we can think about this in terms of how to solve nonlinear equations now this looks like value function looks like gauss jacobi because what you're doing is you're you're changing the value in the k plus one iterate you're changing the value at state i in accordance with something on the right hand side but if you look exactly at what gauss jacobi would do you would see that no it, it what this is what gauss jacobi does See, gauss jacobi would take out the vi component here and then have that weight be over here and then I mean, do, a, do, a, do a max. And so um, anyway, this is what true gauss jacobi would be. This is really pre-Gauss Jacobi. But now what did we say about whether well, it's pre-Gauss Jacobi or Gauss Jacobi? <clears throat> what do we say about Gauss Jacobi? Well, it's slow. And Gauss Seidel is is better so let's just jump to gauss seidel here now what what would gauss seidel iteration be well if the optimal control at state i is u is little u then the gauss seidel iterate would be this so i'm at state i i plug in little u then that means that the the gauss seidel solution update for vi would be equal to this sum where you notice that a vi is missing here well, uh, it's you you have the 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 new guesses the iterate iterate l plus one guesses are used for j less than one and you use the old guesses for j bigger than one <coughs> sorry bigger than i <coughs> and then you divide here and so now then uh, gauss seidel um what you want to do is this is this is what happens for each specific little u and you take the max of all of these and so now you get a gauss seidel iteration and also the thing is that with gauss seidel what happens is that uh, the value function at state at state i changes instantly so uh you can write this um in in this fashion where you don't have to keep track of what iterate you are it's just that um the new uh, guess for i is equal to this now. And we just keep going around and around on that. Um, okay. So Gauss Seidel is going to be much faster um, in general. Now, but no, we're greedy, economists are greedy little bastards. Uh, we want something that goes faster than Gauss Seidel. So, what you do is you analyze the dynamic process. And oftentimes, you know something about the uh, evolution of the state, of the state variables. And so, you want to use that. Now, okay, suppose that um, I have a, now by the way, this, so this is not, an, this picture here doesn't represent an optimal um, policy thing. It just represents, suppose that you had a policy where um, uh, if you start at state seven, you definitely will move to six, and from six you'll move to two, and from two you move to one, and stay there. At five, you'll move to one. Three, you move directly to one. And then four, you move to two and then to one. Now, suppose I wanted to compute the value of this. 
Um, now, I could write all this down as a, a, not a linear system of equations. The value of being um, at five is the payoff at five plus beta times something to do with one. And so I could get a linear set system of equations. So it'd be seven equations and seven unknowns. But if you looked at those equations, what you would find is that there's one equation, you see one is, a st is an absorbing state. If you're here, you stay here. So the value of being at one depends only about, at the payoff at one. It doesn't matter about all these others. So what you can do is you can just quickly, immediately compute this value without looking at any other values. Well, then once you're at five, you can also then compute the value of being at five without looking at anything else. From two, you could compute the value of being at one without it looking, you, know, you can take the value of one and then add with the payoff at two. So what you're going to want, if you're going to solve this, the value for the policy that produces the, the, the solid lines, what you're gonna to wanna to do is use, first of all, solve the problem at this point, and then take that information and use it to solve for five, take that information and use to solve for two. Then once you've got two solved, you use that information to solve for six. Once six is solved, you use that information for seven. And then two can also then tell you what three is, and then three tells you what four is. So this is, um, if you have some idea about how the dynamic states are going to move, you can use that to come up with a more efficient way of updating value functions. <clears throat> now I have a trivial little example here. Um, anyway, I'm gonna write up some more, anyway. Trivial example. So, so then, um, you see with Gauss-Seidel, by the way, you, we all know that with Gauss-Seidel, the order in which you update things matter. And so sometimes what happens is that um, um, the ordering will help you solve the problem for some states, some, some part of the state space, but not for others. Um, then that's where the idea comes in of an alternating sweep, where basically you sweep, you do the updates, let's say start with state i at one and go up one, two, three, up to n, and, the, and that's this case, you do the up sweep, and then you do the down sweep, and, uh, and that's your new guess. So it's kind of like two, two iterations of a Gauss-Seidel's type. Um, oh, by the way, this, yeah. <clears throat> and so, um, and then you stop. Now, with this alternating sweep business in, in one-dimensional problems, this will be very rapid. Uh, for example, if you take a one-dimensional optimal growth problem, uh, basically you sweep up once and sweep down once and you're done. Um, now, uh, that, that's going to be a homework problem, by the way. So uh, doing a discretized um, uh, growth model. And so you'll, you'll see the, the power of the alt that you don't need to know what direction to do. You just try both directions and then it works. Now, sometimes you might be in, in a, um, uh, yeah, so I call this simulated upwind Gauss-Seidel, which I've abbreviated somewhere as S-U-G-S, so it's SUGS. Um, now, suppose you're doing a stochastic problem and you don't know what direction things are going to go. The thing is that once, as you're iterating your value function iterates and getting policies, well, then you're going to be seeing that, well, the states seem to go in this direction. And so at some point it may be sensible to now do another update going along the reverse path. So 
suppose you have a path that you say, oh, okay, that seems to be the direction I'm going to go. Well, now I'm going to um, update in the opposite direction. Uh, I don't, I think some people have tried it. I don't know how good it is. It's, um, but anyway, it's, it's, it's an idea to, along these lines and probably much more um, valuable in big problems. Now, I'm not um, going to talk much about it, but this is also obviously parallelizable. Now, even the Gauss, the Gauss-Seidel iteration, this is even parallelizable to good, to to a good um, degree. And the idea is that um, the simple idea is that you have. Um, oh, th this is really like my example of how parallel programming is like having a. Uh, a swarm of um, piranhas sort of uh, consuming some some victim. So in suppose you're on you're on a CPU that has 20 cores. So that in the shared memory you put in the value function, the vector, the, the discretized value function. And then you tell the cores to update um, these values. So the core, even randomly, you said, so each core randomly picks one of these uh, states. And, and then when it wants to do the updating, it needs to then make a copy of what the value function is at that time. And then it does this max. Um, and then when it's updated the VI, it then uh, changes VI in, um, in the shared memory. And so the piranha aspect of this that I'm talking about is that it's totally unorganized. Uh, each piranha grabs, it, each core grabs one of these Vs um, and chews on it. And maybe it basically like puts a stamp on it and says, oh, I'm updating uh, Vj for J equals 352. So stay away. And then it updates and then it puts in the new value for it. So this is an example of massive asynchronous parallelization. No organization, no coordination. They just all together chew on this problem. And this is going to converge. Why? Because of the monotonicity. And so um, I actually did have a Aria a couple of years ago, write up C++ code, which actually did this. And it was, uh, it was astonishing that it worked so well. Um, so this is um, <coughs> massive parallelism is available for these kinds of problems. Dynamic programming, definitely. Uh, some of you may recognize that a lot of these ideas look like they could be used for dynamic games. Don't do that leap. That, um, one has to be very careful uh, before doing that, taking that leap. Now, the last slide here is on a completely different approach <coughs> to solving these problems. This is called the linear programming approach. It actually goes back to, I've got to find out who first, uh, it goes back to the 60s, where um, somebody says one way, now by the way, notice this is particularly, we have finite number of states and a finite number of controls. So a finite number of states and the set of controls is finite also. Now, so the value function, vi is a solution that vector vi is a solution to the following linear programming problem you minimize the sum of the components of the vi's well right now that sounds like boy that's just going to go down to minus infinity but you put some constraints on it that vi 
each, each VI has to be bigger than the payoff at XI choosing control U uh, and that's M, M plus the discounted future value of, of doing that. That, so think of what, what if tomorrow's, think about this, if, if V is tomorrow's value function, then VI is the value to being at state I today if I choose control U. The VI has to be bigger than all of the possible choices of this for this control. And also this total expression has to be true for all I. Now that's gonna keep this VI from going down to minus infinity because um, uh, basically be, because beta is less than one. Um, it's, it, it, so if basically if it was, if this was minus a billion, if all the VIs are minus a billion, and then you, you hit it with the um, uh, beta 0.99, then this would say, and pi was positive, then this way is a VI has to be bigger, bigger than 0.99 times negative a billion. Well, that's, that means that this has to be bigger than negative a billion. So anyway, so, so those inequalities <coughs> put a floor on things. It turns out that the solution to this linear programming problem is the solution to the Bellman equation. <clears throat> now in the past, when this, this was just tossed out there in the 60s, and of course at that time, this had no chance of being useful. It was a cute little thing. Um, then Trick and Zinn, um, and this is the same Zinn as Epstein's Zinn, um, they did use this, um, with plus some tricks, and it was successful. Now this originated in the operations research literature, and they um, they had kind of abandoned this. But recent, by the way, this shows you how um, old the slide is. Uh, the so-called recent work was done in the early two thousands uh, by Daniela Pucci de Farias and Ben Van Roy. Ben Van Roy is a very successful. Um, uh, professor here at Stanford. Um, and Daniela Pucci de Farias, I hear, is a very successful um, uh, uh, dancer in Argentina, um, that special kind of dance at Argentinian club. Anyway, so she's no longer an academic, but he still is. But her PhD thesis uh, in the early 2000s sort of re energized the um, interest in the oral literature in this method. Um, so I haven't seen this used a great deal, um, <clears throat> in, um, in economics, uh, but again, the, the hardware and software has changed. Um, f like, f for example, um, Trick and Zinn, I, I don't know what linear programming algorithms they had. They might have just had simplex methods, simplex algorithm code. I don't know, but um, uh, interior point methods now can handle uh, enormous problems. Uh, by the way, each of these constraints is for many problems going to be very sparse. So I don't know. It, it's a matter of um, uh, of things, uh, uh, the technology, software, hardware changing um because by the way this is something that maybe that's even parallelizable in which case that'd be great now nathan asks uh, about licq um licq is irrelevant here because it's a linear programming problem now by the way licq may fail for in these linear programming problems or in linear programming problems in, often. But um, the algorithms for linear programming, or simplex algorithm in particular for linear programming, does not need LICQ. Um, LICQ is needed when you rely on the KKT conditions. Um, now, LIC for interior point methods, 
that may be a uh, a problem, a more of a problem. But anyway, the uh, I remember one time I came up with a counter ex an example of LICQ failing, and I had three. It was a consumer optimization problem with three linear constraints. And I showed it to this mathematician and he went berserk because he said, oh, linear programming, there's LICQ is never a problem, never a problem with LICQ. Well, anyway. So um, linear problems with linear constraints, you can solve just by traversing the um, edges of the defining um, uh, simplex or defining constraint set. Um, so LICQ here is not directly applicable. Um, it may be for some particularly particular implementations of it, um, if you used uh, nonlinear programming with some relaxation. But nothing um, is, there's no general, LICQ need not be important. Okay, Nathan, does that answer the question? Um, good question, but, um, um, it, uh, for linear programming stuff, uh, LICQ is not important, is not relevant. Um, it'd be interesting to see what, how well this scales up nowadays. Um, uh, okay, so that is, uh, oh, it's 1030, um, or 730 or whatever. Um, so that is the introduction to dynamic programming and then also a discussion of the various methods for discrete states and discrete controls. Now, for con discrete states and continuous controls, uh, it pretty much all goes through the same. Um, for uh, the Bellman equation here for continuous, the only thing here for um, if if you have a continuous set of controls, then and u is a continuous variable, then um, you're you're doing an optimization over little u, and if pi is a concave function of little u and these probabilities are nicely behaved then um then this is then this is going to be a, a nice convex problem in you or concave problem in you and so you're you'll be in good shape so you know unless you have some crazy um little u crazy interactions between you and the state variable here in, in the pi function and in the and in the um, transition rules, unless you have something kind of nutty there, uh, this is all gonna go through for continuous um, choices of uh, uh, models with continuum of, of controls. But discrete states is the key thing here. Um, now, I, um, so what's going to happen is on, on Thursday, I'm going to talk about an example where, um, uh, where empirical work, I'm, part of it is going to be about um, estimation within the um, Rust bus model, um, which is a, a model, a finite state dynamic programming problem. And, uh, and which for to which we apply the the MPEC approach. I also talk about um, uh, BLP models. Now, by the way, um, don't 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 wait for me to give you a coherent explanation of the BLP model. Um, it's a model of product differentiation. What I am going to focus on there is um, how numerical integration. Um, do it, good quadrature improves things a great deal. So I'm going to do that, that on Thursday. Um, and then next week, I'm going to come back to um, uh, dynamic programming, dynamic problems in general, but where um, <clears throat> we consider continuous states.
Now that's a much more interesting problem in many ways. Um, and, uh, but, and some of these ideas go through, some don't. And, uh, but first, these are the basic ideas. And the more that you can use these ideas for accelerating convergence, the better off you are.